Hi, this is Jeff with FrostyGarden.com, and today we're going to be talking about how we raise over a thousand garden starts from seed for our subarctic garden every single season. We've been growing indoors for a very long time, and we've got a lot of really good ideas around germinating and growing seeds indoors. So if this sounds like something you'd be interested in, we invite you to come along for the ride and participate in this video if you so choose. The goal of this video series is to take you all the way from seed up until a garden transplant that you can then put into your garden. We're going to start with introducing you to the equipment that we use, and then we're going to move into how we use that particular equipment. And interspersed throughout, we're going to be talking about helpful tips and good ideas of how to raise garden starts from seed indoors. We've got a whole lot of ground to cover with this particular topic, and so we need to break this video into a two-part series. Part one, which you're watching right now, is going to be about the initial germination process of our plants. And then part two is going to be after we do an initial transplant, all the way up until the point where we put those plants into our garden. And together, these two parts are going to cover everything that we do from individual seed up until we have a transplant that we can then put into our garden. Before we get too far into it, we need to mention a couple of things. First, we have to grow indoors out of necessity. We live in the subarctic, and when we start our garden, we still have negative temperatures outside and feet of snow on the ground. And so growing in like a greenhouse, even if it's heated, really isn't a financially feasible option for us. Second, we've pursued a lot of goals of trying to minimize the amount of space that our indoor garden uses. We don't live in a particularly large home, and so space savings is a of utmost important to us. And lastly, what we'll tell you is that there are many different ways to grow from seed. We're going to show you what we do and what we've learned over the years, uh, but there are multiple ways that you can go about things, and there isn't just one right way of growing everything from seed. First, let's talk about our germination kit. Our germination kit is largely comprised of three major components. First, we have what's called a 1020 tray. Then we use what's called a seeding tray. And then after that, we have what's called a humidity dome. These three pieces are largely used with all of our germination process. And for the most part, almost every seed that we grow is using this kit. We do have a couple of exceptions that we're gonna talk about further in this video. So let's get a little bit more into the 1020 tray. First, it's really about plant mobility. So it allows us to move a whole lot of plants very, very quickly and very easily. So that's the primary reason we use it. It's called a 1020 tray because it's 10 inches wide by 20 inches long, and it can fit a number of different things. There's a whole lot of accessories that you can get for the 1020 tray system. But we like to buy really high quality or heavy duty versions of these trays. And specifically, our trays are from a company called Bootstrap Farmer, which is a US based company, and they make some extremely hot heavy duty trays and we like those because they last us for a very very long time. The second component that we mentioned is the seeding tray and what this is about is it gives us individual spaces to germinate our individual seeds. We specifically use a 200 cell tray and so that means we have 200 individual growing sites that we can use in our tray. Not all seeding trays will fit into a 1020 tray, but a few of the sizes that we've found that will commonly fit are 200 cell, 128 cell, and 72 cell, but you really need to check with the manufacturer to make sure that it's going to actually fit into a 1020 tray if that's your actual goal. We like using seeding trays because it allows us to grow a lot of seeds in a very small amount of space. In our case, 200 seeds can be germinated in a 10 by 20 inch space. So again, just like with our 1020 trays, our seeding trays are also from Bootstrap Farmer. They are very high quality trays and they are gonna last a very long time. We've been using ours for at least five seasons now and they've held up exceptionally well. The cheaper ones are definitely cheaper, but they generally won't last nearly as long as a heavy duty, high quality tray. Technically, the use of a seeding tray is optional and you can directly sow into larger containers. The big reason that we like to use a seeding tray is is that it very easily allows us to over sow the number of seeds and then we can select the very best of the best genetics to bring forward into our garden. Also again with space savings in mind it allows us to germinate a lot of seeds in a very small amount of space. So again we can grow almost 200 seeds in 10 inches by 20 inches of space which is an exceptional number of seeds to be able to germinate in such a small space. 
And the last component that we're going to talk about is the humidity dome. And what this is about is for increasing the relative humidity around our seeds. Seeds are very sensitive to the soil drying out and they can perish very, very quickly if they dry out too quickly. And so what this allows us to do is capture a lot of the humidity for those seedlings and it allows them to have much higher survival rates. There's some little vents at the top of the dome that allow us to increase or reduce the amount of relative humidity around our seeds and you can adjust it as needed throughout the season. Next, we're going to talk about our growing spaces. Growing spaces are very flexible in their design, and there's a number of different ways that you can approach them. For us, we have a more permanent installation with a growing tent here, like you see behind me, and that really works for us because we have a number of different needs throughout the season for growing various plants, such as our indoor house plants, and caring for them over the winter. But you can also use temporary and seasonal based growing tables that you set up throughout the season as they are needed. And so they can be more permanent or more temporary in design. And we actually use both methodologies in our growing process. One thing we will touch on is there's two major philosophies that you can use. You can use what we would call a single plane of growing or a flat growing space. And then you can also use a shelf based system in order to get better vertical density of your indoor garden over the, over the space that you're using. We've gravitated heavily towards a single plane of growing. And the biggest reason that we like that is that it allows us very easily to see all of our plants all in one go and we can catch individual problems that might be happening with our plants very, very quickly. Also, it's easier to water and easier to move your plants around. While you can maybe save a little bit of space using a shelf-based system, it surprisingly doesn't save you as much space as you might expect. Next, we're going to talk about our indoor grow lighting. And it's really important to be using indoor grow lighting because the ambient light that you're going to get in, say, like a windowsill is not going to be sufficient in order to grow nice, high quality, compact garden starts. So high quality lighting is of some degree of importance. We've generally gravitated towards using lesser numbers of higher quality and higher power lights as opposed to more quantity of lower power lights. Also, these days, our opinion is that LED is the only technology that really makes sense these days. The operational cost of LED lights is much less than, say, compact fluorescent or definitely incandescent lighting. And so if you're concerned about your operational costs of growing indoors like we are with very high electrical costs, LED is definitely the way to go. Our specific very favorite lighting right now are called quantum boards. And specifically, we like to use quantum boards from a company called Horticultural Lighting Group. And they're a US-based company, and they make very, very high quality products. As for the lighting schedule that you wanna use, you generally wanna be between 12 and 16 hours. We split the difference and go with 14 hours. That lighting schedule can be done during the day or it can be done overnight. And in Northern locations like where we're at, there's a little bit of strategy that goes into it. We run our growing tent during the day, but we grow our temporary growing tables during the night. And what this allows is for the extra heat that's generated by the lighting to provide a little bit of extra ambient heat for our home. So th there might be adjustments, but you can run them all at the same time or definitely separately if that's what works better for you. As for the temperatures, that is really important. What we'll tell you is that almost all seeds germinate well between 65 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And so it's pretty important to try to get a target a temperature of around that. And that's generally what our indoor temperatures are most of the time. If you're trying to grow in a somewhat cooler environment, like maybe a partially heated garage, you may want to invest into what are called heat mats. And those basically sit beneath your tray and they provide a little bit of ambient and heat and get the seeds up to that perfect uh, germination temperature. What happens if you try to grow your seeds outside of that ideal temperature range, you can actually have failures to germinate or it can take an exceptionally long time for those seeds to germinate. 
So we start our plants lives in our seeding trays. The first thing that we do is we fill the seeding tray with soil. And in a lot of years, we've preferred using ProMix because it's a very high quality soil. But in years like this one, where we weren't able to get ProMix, we end up making our own seeding soil. And our recipe that we use is two parts cocoa core, one part perlite, and one part vermiculite. And this makes a very nice, fluffy, but not super compact soil that the seeds can push their roots into and make a very nice plug for us to transplant into regular potting soil. Hi there, Future Editing Jeff here. And I forgot to include a really important point, and that's how and when we know to sow particular seeds. And for that, we use what's called a sowing schedule, or sometimes called a seeding schedule. And in case you didn't know, we publish the most comprehensive northern seed sowing schedule that's available on the planet. If you're interested in it, there's a link down in the description that'll take you right to it. It's generally important to sow your seeds into relatively compact soil. So one of the things that we do is we go through and we actually push down the soil in our individual seeding cells, and we try to make that as compact as possible. What'll happen is if you don't fill that up completely, as you water the plants, the soil is going to drop and you're not going to get a very nice plug. So making sure that you have a nice compact space to sow your so seeds into is generally a really important thing to try to achieve. When we're ready to sow our seeds, what we do is we generally go along and try to make a small depression that we can then put our seed into. We generally reserve the top row of our seeding tray for plant labels, and so we don't use that. And another thing that we try to do is that for every six pack that we're growing, we try to grow one single row of plants shortwise along the 1020 tray. And if you're keeping track, that's nine individual seeds that we're sowing per six pack that we're trying to achieve. And what this allows us to, to deal with is any kind of germination failures or problems that we might have. When we're growing a lot of a particular kind of plant, like maybe onions, for example, we might reduce the number of total rows that we grow because we have enough seeds that are over sown in order to deal with those particular failures. Once we have the little depressions in our soil, then we can go along and sow the individual seeds in our cells. And generally we try to sow one seed per cell. In some cases when we're expecting relatively low germination rates out of our seeds, maybe because they're old or something like that, we might sow two or more seeds in each individual cell. But in general, our target is to try to get one plant per individual cell so that we don't have to separate those plants out later. Sometimes that does happen, so if it does, don't really worry about it that much. Seed sowing depth does matter a little bit, but we can actually fix that later with this particular process, and we're gonna talk about how we do that. Another important thing is that we label as we go. We don't rely on our memory because it's faulty. And so as we plant the individual seeds, we make sure we get a label. And in our case, we use one label for uh, multiple rows that we might be sowing. And we have a very specific coding mechanism so that we remember exactly how those are sowed and we don't have any confusion of what sowed where. As we work through different seeds, we just continue to move down the tray. And it doesn't really matter if we have different plants growing next to different plants. In general, what we're trying to get to is an entirely full tray. And if we don't end up using the entire tray in one particular sewing session, that's okay. We just continue off where we left off, usually the next weekend, and we wait until we get the entire tray filled. Once we're done with our sewing, that's when we go ahead and cover our seeds with our soil. So we're generally doing Doing what's called a surface sow, and then we add soil on top of it after the fact. And this is how we're able to control very precisely the soil sowing depth that we're using. There's a really good rule of thumb that you can use with seeds, and that you want to have about twice the amount of soil as the width of the seed. So for example, if you have a seed that's approximately an eighth of an inch, you want to get about a quarter of an inch of soil over that particular seed. If it's a super tiny seed, then you want just the lightest amount of soil over that particular seed. And using this process, we can very easily control it. Also, some seeds require that you don't put any soil over it and that you just surface sow. And for those, you wanna check your seed packets, and if it says not to cover it, make sure you don't cover it with any soil. So using the seeding tray like this, we can control that soil sowing depth very, very easily across different kinds of plants. 
So at this point, we're ready to water in our seeds. And we really like using what's called a pressure sprayer. It's a small pressure sprayer that we picked up at a big box store years ago. They're usually under 10 bucks. And they allow you to put down a whole lot of water very, very quickly and without having to squeeze a, a spray bottle. And so you can save your arms a lot of trouble. And we really like using that. And what we would also tell you is you don't wanna be shy about the amount of water that you're putting into your tray. You generally want a fair bit of water to go into it. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get water throughout the soil. So if you just do a really light surface spray of the uh, soil, what's gonna end up happening is that, so that water is going to wick into the rest of the soil and your overall moisture content in the soil is gonna be somewhat light. So don't be shy about how much water you lay down. Generally for an entire tray like this, we're laying in usually two to four cups of water into the tray and that's enough for us to get a good moisture level across all of our soil in each tray. You are gonna have to continue to repeat the watering process and basically you do that once the soil starts to look dry. When it looks dry, we just get out our little pressure sprayer and add a little bit more water. It's perfectly okay if part of your soil is dry and the rest is not to only water the particular part of the soil that is actually dry and not necessarily overwater the rest of the tray. That's a very normal thing that happens, so if it happens to you, don't really worry about it. So after we get done watering our trays, that's when the humidity dome goes on. In general, we keep the humidity dome on our plants throughout the initial germination process and even in early plant growth like these onions that I have behind me here. And in general, those plants, especially when they're young, want a high humidity environment. So that humidity dome stays on almost all the time. Again, you can use the little vents at the top of the humidity dome to dial in the humidity levels. And so if you're getting green stuff growing on your soil, simply open up those vents and that'll allow the humidity to be a little bit less and you won't necessarily have that problem. Another important thing that we'll mention is that we germinate all of our seeds under light. So this can trip up some newer gardeners especially because you might have run into the practice where some gardeners germinate under darkness. And what we would tell you is that all plants will germinate under light, but some plants will not germinate without light. And when you germinate under 100% lighting, you don't have to worry about what kinds of seeds will germinate under light and which ones won't all seeds will germinate under light. And so we generally have our seeds under light from the moment that we sow them all the way up until germination. And this also allows them to get light almost immediately. And so, whereas if you grow in darkness, you end up having to watch those like a hawk and you wanna get them under grow lighting as soon as you possibly can. So earlier we mentioned that we do have some exceptions to this particular growing process. Almost all of our seeds use this process. But for exceptionally large and fast growing plants like corn, cucumber, and squash, we end up sowing those seeds into much larger containers. And the reason is, is if we sowed them into the seeding tray, we would end up having to transplant them almost immediately, usually within a day or two. And so we sow those directly into larger containers. And for us, we generally prefer to use a 606 jumbo insert or directly sow into a three and a half inch pot, depending on the particular plant. For corn, we use 606 inserts. And for cucumber and squash, we use larger three and a half inch pots. And those are generally a final transplant point. So we sow them into that and we don't have to transplant them after that particular sowing happens. So again, the use of this seeding tray, we're really trying to target the initial germination and very earliest levels of plant growth. We do eventually wanna transplant all of these plants into a larger container so that they can continue to grow and continue to get larger. So at some point we need to transplant these out and we're gonna talk about the metrics that we use to determine when we should be transplanting these into larger containers. The first indicator that we can use is the actual plant's growth. So usually a good target in a 200 cell seeding tray like we're using here is when the plant starts to put on its first true leaves. At that point, the plant really needs a little bit more soil. And so we can use that as a fairly reliable indicator that we need to transplant into a larger container. That doesn't always work though, because for example, with our onions here, there are no leaves that we can use as a particular indicator that we need to transplant up into a larger container. 
The second thing that you can use is to look at the bottom of the tray. You can pull up the tray and if you see roots coming out of the bottom, that's a very good indicator that the roots have taken up the soil that they have available to them and they need to be transplanted into a larger container. So that's a very reliable mechanism, but it doesn't necessarily always work either. And so sometimes we just end up pulling a plug and we see if it comes out as a nice, good, solid plug, then we know that plant is is ready to be transplanted into those larger containers. So using one of those three techniques is the, the right way to determine whether you need to transplant into larger containers. And in general, we wanna do that before the plant actually needs that additional soil. And that's where we're gonna call the end of this video. As we mentioned, this is going to be a two-part series and the next part that will be out very soon is gonna be everything from our transplant up until the point where we get the plant into our garden. There's a whole lot of things that we have to be concerned about there. And so we're gonna tackle that in the next video. I would like to thank you for watching. If you liked our content, we'd love it if you gave us a like and subscribe. And as always, if you have any comments or questions, do go ahead and put those down below and we'll try to get back to you on them. Once again, thanks for watching and I look forward to seeing you next time.